First of all, thanks so much, Sean, for uh, you know, inviting me to be here today and for the brilliant introduction. <laughs> Uh, so the talk today is going to be about network visualization at, at the age of infinite interconnectedness. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few topics today. I've got plenty of time. So I'm going to talk first about the outburst of, of visualization and you know, one of the key, some of the key reasons behind this outburst is the emergence of visualization. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about visualcomplexity.com, which is a, a project, a website that some of you might already know. Uh, and then talk about some trends and methods in the field of network visualization, uh, talk about some principles, um, and then finally end up with a little bit of a teaser. Uh, you know, is our networks becoming a new cultural meme? So the first time I actually heard about information visualization was actually to a, a teacher of mine called Christopher Kerwin, and he was a really sort of inspiring lecturer at Parsons School of Design. And he showed us this diagram called the, the Understanding Spectrum by Nathan Shadroff, where data leads into information, information leads into knowledge, and knowledge ultimately leads into wisdom. And even though my background was actually uh, industrial design, I was just so compelled to be part of that process, particularly that divide between producers and consumers, between information and knowledge, and how to best create a bridge between those two elements. But of course, many of you might, you know, of course, say that information visualization is not something new. We have been doing it for ages as human beings, right? I mean, some of these a examples are, are remarkable. This one is the diagram of the square of a position uh, you know, from 1505, done by the Spanish schooler Juan de Salaya, mapping a lot of philosophical concepts and, and, and contradictions. A uh, beautiful, remarkable example of visual complexity in the, min in the Middle Ages. And then you have the, the beautiful examples of, of Ramon Lull, uh, the guy, you know, the very original guy behind a lot of the binary code. Uh, so these, actually, these diagrams, you know, creating a new language, were done more than 700 years ago, and they still have, you know, remarkable quality to them. And even though, even if you look back at the history of humankind, you can identify key milestones where visualization played a key role in, you know, changes in society and the culture of the time. In fact, Professor Alfred Crosby, in his uh, really interesting book called The Measure of Reality, says that, Visualization and measurement were the two factors most responsible for the rapid development of all modern science. Uh, and I highly advise you to, if you haven't read that book, it's really interesting that it explores you know, our obsession for visualization and for measurement and quantification through the Middle Ages. So it's like, you know, the very sort of original foundation for a lot of the work that we actually do, do nowadays. But as all of us know, of course, this outburst of visualization has occurred you know, within the past 10 years or so. Even when I launched the blog, there was only a few other blogs, I think maybe two or three, around the topic of, of information visualization. It was still very a niche, a niche sort of market. Uh, but then, of course, in the last five years, it has been an explosion of blogs and websites, many of them really, really specific on a specific method, method or technique about visualization. So this outburst of, this outburst of interest for visualization has primarily six reasons um, that I'm, I would like to expose. The first one is really tied, it ties back with computing storage. And it's, it really explains that our ability to generate data has by far outpassed our ability to make sense of that, of that data. And a great example to understand, you know, this first reason for this outburst of visualization, computing storage, is to look at Crider's law. And Crider's law is actually very similar to, to Moore's law. It just says that our disk capacity doubles every 18 months. And Crider's law has been actually being, you know, in most cases, you know, correct, although it has been slowing down you know, over the past two years. But if you, if you take Crider's Law, and you can see Crider's Law in many different cases, probably the best one that everyone can relate to is the iPod. Uh, so the iPod, when it was firstly launched in 2001, had five gigabytes of storage. Uh, six years later, uh, the same iPod, the iPod Classic, had 160 gigabytes of data. Right? This is the Crider's Law in action. And then if you actually take that analogy, the Crider's Law, and, and actually project that into the future, according to some projections, by the year 2030, a regular laptop like the one I have in front of me would have the ability to store one petabyte of data. This is a very knowledgeable audience, so that means one petabyte is one million gigabytes of data. And even more striking is that if you compare that to be 10 times all the books of the biggest library in the world, which is the Library of Congress. So it's the equivalent of storing 300 million books in your laptop. And again, the challenge is not so much to store all this information, but really to make sense, to filter, and make that bridge between information and knowledge. 
Another example I, I usually give when we talk about computing storage is you know, this effort of, you know, it has been going on from you know, the, Greek, the ancient Greece, of gathering the whole of human knowledge. Uh, so in 1751, uh, it was the biggest encyclopedia of the time, the, the, the French encyclopedia by Diderot and Lambert. And at the time, this massive encyclopedia had 70,000 articles, uh, 3,000 illustrations, and it was comprised of 35 volumes. If we compare to the, to the recent, you know, to the latest Wikipedia in just the English version, in 2009, Wikipedia, the English version, actually surpassed the 3 million uh, mark of number of articles. And it had 2, two million something images, probably more now. Uh, and then, actually, someone went to the effort of calculating all that information in physical volumes, and it calculated to be around, roughly around 1,300 volumes of information. And that's purely text, really tiny font as well. <laughs> so excluding any kind of illustrations or images, which is, you know, again, really, really striking, this, you know, this explosion of computing storage. So the second reason for this outburst of interest for visualization is really tying back with open data sets. Data has never been so widely accessible at such a minimal cost. I mean, many of us that deal on a daily basis with, with online social services, it has been, data has become this online currency. You know, we, we exchange, we give some data to receive some data in return. That's usually the, the way it works. And then not only that, but you actually see a lot more companies, institutions, cities, and, and governments and countries itself really opening up their public data sets to the general public. And this, of course, has been extremely beneficial in many ways. What you can see here is actually some of the projects that have been taking advantage of a lot of these open data sets. Uh, so some of them allow you to upload your own data uh, or, or, or use existing data sets on the server and visualize them in different ways. Uh, probably the best one at doing that is, is Many Eyes, an IBM-led initiative. But many of them, you know, already exist, and we probably, you know, many more will actually, you know, s pop up in the next in the next few years. So the third key reason, uh, in my view, for this outburst is really tying back to again online social networks. And we might think, you know, it's primarily about mapping really, really complex relationships. And that's, that's definitely the case. I mean, for social sciences, this is a great opportunity never, that we never had before to map these really, really complex communities, you know, such, such as Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on. But it's not just about mapping these really, really complex relationships between people. It's also about discovering patterns within the abundance of shared content. Uh, it's about uncovering music affinities by mapping services like uh, Last.fm, or even trying to understand how human beings categorize information by visualizing different aspects of the social bookmarking system delicious. But even more than that, a lot of these online social networks are providing us, users, with a remarkable number of tools allowing us to track and map the most mundane daily activity, from tracking how your mood changes over time using mood stats, to how many miles you run in a day, or even track your sexual activity in, uh, in bad posts which is a remarkable project. Uh, so online social networks have really, really this power to really, and really this force beyond a lot of this new interest for visualization. The fourth key reason is really the democratization of a lot of those tools. And again, if we go back a few years, a lot of you know, visualization was a very you know, scientific uh, arena that only a few people with high, you know, a high sort of knowledge for, for programming could actually be, you know, develop any project in this, in this field. But more and more, we see different tools making it a lot more accessible, usable for a lot more people. And this is actually one of the key reasons. So these are, are some of those tools, and many more exist, and many more will, again, continue to exist. Many more will pop up in the next few years. But a lot of these tools, such as Flash, Processing, et cetera, are just making it a lot more easy and accessible. And, and those are a key reason that explains why art and design are really joining this, this, this visualization effort that for a long period of time was just uh, within the, the scientific uh, area. So the fifth reason for this outburst uh, is really tying with mainstream media. It's really this case for vernacular visualization. Uh, so all the projects that you actually see here uh, have been, yeah, the contrast is a little bit awkward, but uh, so all the projects that you actually see here have been developed by the New York Times. And of course, many of you are, are sort of paying attention to you know, even the last US elections. And you've seen, you know, not just the New York Times, but CNN, you know, Boston Globe, et cetera, et cetera, just really pushing the boundaries in, in, the, in the ways that they visualize a lot of the data that they already have. And services like the New York Times, New York Times is probably one of my favorite, if not my favorite, in, in terms of you know, achieving that really well. But the New York Times 
and many other mainstream media have been really, really important in just changing the public awareness that visualization goes much further than the typical bar chart or the typical pie chart. It can be extremely rich, dynamic, interactive, and convey information in a much, much, much uh, more meaningful way. So the sixth and final reason is really a consequence of all those previous reasons. It's really that, you know, do all, because of all those reasons that we I just exposed before, you know, there's this growth of, of our community in itself, which you know, some people call the numerati. Actually, Stephen Baker calls this community the numerati. And on the book by the same name, Stephen Baker says, the numerati are looking for patterns in data that describe something almost hopelessly complex, human life and behavior. Um, so again, if we go back a few years, we were just a few, right? 10 years, we were just a few scientists closing the you know, in a, in a room somewhere, trying to really knuckle our brains and trying to visualize different data sets. But this, this community has been growing at an outstanding pace and uh, growing and growing. <laughs> so as a numerati myself, uh, I've been primarily uh, interested and passionate about network visualization and really captivated by the power of networks. And this passion really started around six years ago. Uh, I was uh, I was doing uh, my master's degree in at Parsons School of Design in New York, and at the time I was really interested about uh, information diffusion, understanding how information spreads within across across a, a specific community of people, and this again has been a subject of interest for social science for many 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 years and centuries, and it has been really hard to tackle. So the, the idea of word of mouth and again how information spreads across people is really really hard to track within a physical environment. But then, of course, came the internet. It came the blogosphere, and it, it made actually it created this amazing social laboratory to, for us to investigate and to map how information spreads. So the analogy that I took for, for my thesis was actually in URLs. So a particular URL that's posted in some blog, and now that same URL spreads across the blogosphere. And in many ways, there is a huge resemblance to how diseases spread within communities. It's actually a, a huge sort of similarity in the sense that the patterns are really, really similar. Some you know, they have this huge outburst and then completely die off. Others are very recurrently psych cyclical nature. And now I built this tool to really understand how the, that, inf that type of information, or particularly URLs, memes, actually spread across the blogosphere. But to have a better understanding of, of, of the process, I first had to start collecting maps and visualizations of the, of the infrastructure itself, how the blogosphere and the World Wide Web was actually being mapped. So that's why I started collecting dozens and hundreds <laughs> and hundreds of projects, which became uh, you know, visualcomplexity.com. And the goal has been to always leverage this critical understanding of, of different visualization methods across a very, you know, variety of disciplines from you know, as versus biology, social networks, or, or the World Wide Web. What you actually see in the bottom, it's, it's a quote from Amanda Bloks talking about visual complexity, where he says that in VC, the reader is just as likely to come across a representation of a protein network as they would be to see a map of a subway or social interaction. And you can really see this, this pluralistic effort when you look at all the different categories that I'm mapping currently on the website. So currently I'm mapping more than 750 projects, again, from social networks, from art, biology, World Wide Web, music, political networks, et cetera, et cetera. So again, you could probably you know, do the same, a similar website uh, only concentrating on, on, on biology or only concentrating on social networks. And you probably would have you know, many, many projects to analyze and, and, and expose. But I think that the key quality here is really to try to understand the, the vast variety of efforts from the vast variety of disciplines that people are, and the efforts that people are making in many, many different areas and disciplines. And only then we can really find sort of commonalities, differences and commonalities and common patterns in the way that people are trying to, to tackle and decipher a lot of these networks. And of course, the key reason also for this you know, holistic and pluralistic approach of visual complexity is that networks are really everywhere. It is this ubiquitous, omnipresent structure. right? So the brain is a network of nerve cells connected by axons. Cells themselves are networks of, of molecules connected by, by biochemical reactions. Of course, societies, networks of people, you know, by different degrees of relationships. And of course, on a larger scale, food webs, ecosystems are all represented by networks of species. And then, of course, it really ties back to a lot of the, our human technology that, you know, in the internet, power grids, transportation systems, those are just a few examples of what, you know, that really showcase how the network model is such an ubiquitous structure. 
And, and lately, um, over the past three years, I actually found out the, the, the great work by, by American scientists called my American scientist Warren Weaver. Uh, and this has been you know, a critical pivot of force for, for a lot of my research and you know, my forthcoming book as well. So in 1951, Warren Weaver uh, actually divided uh, modern science in three different stages. The first, stages, uh, the first stage covering the 17th, 18th, and 19th century is what Weaver called to be problems of simplicity, in the sense that during that period, scientists were primarily concerned about one specific variable affects the other, to what he calls problems of simplicity. And then moving on to the first half of the 20th century, uh, you know, scientists really became aware that just, that's not just you know, a couple or a few variables, there's a lot more going on. But in many ways, the relationships between the, a lot of those variables were thought to be chaotic or many times you know, random to what Warren Weaven considers to be problems of disorganized complexity. And then moving forward to the second half of the 20th century and, and the, the current stage where we are now, uh, it's really, you know, scientists are really becoming aware, as all of you in the audience know, that it's not just about a large number of variables, but also like all of these variables are highly interconnected and highly interdependent to what Warren Weaven considers to be the problems of organized complexity. And we see these problems of organized complexity in many, many different scenarios, from the way we're trying to map our brain to the way we're trying to understand our cities, our ecosystems, and our globe. So it's really the, the key challenges, key scientific challenge of this century is really dealing with a lot of these problems of organized complexity. So what's also interesting when you gather this you know, vast database of projects from many, many different areas is that if you you tend to find some current patterns, some current trends within this database itself. So I'm just going to talk about you know, some of the key trends that I think are really, really interesting uh, across visual complexity. So the first one, the first trend, is really tying back to the blogosphere. And of course, this is really close to my heart in the sense that it's very you know, similar to the kind of effort I was doing for my, my MFA thesis. So the blogosphere has been a recurring theme within, within visual complexity. Uh, so the, the image number one is actually mapping the U.S. political blogosphere, and it's it's a very sort of common scenario. People trying to understand, you know, the de the, the Democrat uh, the Democrat and Republican blogs and how they are interconnected. And the reason they do that is to try and understand if that in that level of interconnection, that level of of this public discourse within the blogosphere, can actually explain the outcome of a given election. And then you have the same sort of uh, project done for for France. Uh, that, you know, number two is actually pretty <laughs> faded out for you guys, but it's actually, you can roughly see the shape of France. What's interesting about this project is doing the same thing, mapping opposing, uh, opposing voices in the, in the political blogosphere of France, but it's not just putting blog, not putting the dots in an abstract sort of space. It's actually putting them, attaching them with specific geo-coordinates. So you end up having this, you know, very sort of loose map of France. And it would be really interesting, in my view at least, to have a third layer where you actually saw the outcome of the elections, because then you would have like a direct mapping between, again, online public discourse between the blogs and then the outcome of the elections itself. What, it, what you see in number three is actually one of my favorite projects, mapping the blogosphere. It's, it's actually mapping the, the most active areas of the blogosphere. So what you actually see here on, on, you know, in a really sort of convoluted way, what I actually see number one, it's, uh, it's dailycause.net, one of the most popular blogs out there. And then number two is actually um, boingboing.net, again, again, another really, really popular blog. But what was interesting for me and the author itself was that it created this isolated island that you can actually see here in number three. And the author was really, pretty really surprised. I mean, what is this happening? Why, you know, what's this, this island doing isolated from the rest of the blogosphere? And it turned out that that isolated group was actually live journal users. And live journal, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the tool, but it's very similar to, to WordPress or Blogger. But it tends, what's interesting about life, life journal is that it tends to be used primarily by teenagers. And teenagers, they actually are all interconnected between themselves, but they don't really create a, you know, many outside links with the, the entire blogosphere. So you end up having this really tightly neat, uh, isolated group from the blogosphere. And this is the type of outcome for me that really addresses you know, the power of visualization. I mean, this would be an extremely hard insight to have by just looking at, you know, at different spreadsheets. Uh, so moving on, I mean, another key trend has been, you know, Flickr. A lot of you probably know Flickr, you know, this photo sharing uh, website. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people are trying to map Flickr in many different ways. Uh, this guy was actually trying to map the entire community of Flickr in the, in the early days, and I think he quit really fast <laughs> uh, trying to do that. But I think one of my favorite projects mapping Flickr is the trace, it's tracing the visitor's eyes, the number, number three. 
So tracing the visited eyes was actually made in the city of Barcelona. And the author basically grabbed a bunch of, of photos taken again in the city of Barcelona and only grabbed two things, the, the time that a photo was taken and the geo-coordinate of that image. And with only those two values, they, they, he actually was able to recreate the path that people make as they snap photos across the city of Barcelona. So then you have this, this map of the popular path, of the popular touristic paths within the city of Barcelona, which is again a remarkable insight that, as you can imagine, for the mayor of the city, urban planners, you know, different uh, advocacy groups. I mean, there's a huge sort of number of, of insights that, that could and have been leveraged due to this you know, mapping of, of Flickr images, which is probably you know, really striking in my view. And then Moving on, I mean, we have GPS, and GPS is, is like a really growing trend, of course, in, in visual complexity and many other, many other websites. So GPS is really interesting. So the first one is actually uh, um, uh, an image of the open street map uh, of the city of London. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the open street map, but it's a, user, it's a large user-generated map of the world in the sense that anyone with a GPS receiver can just go out, you know, grab a bicycle, run, or using a car, and just track their own routes uh, and then upload, that, uh, upload those routes to the, to, the, to the centralized server, which really creates this huge, you know, large user-generated map of the world. And what's interesting about different layers of the open street map is that if people don't use a certain route, the, the route doesn't even show up, right? So it is, in many ways, also like a map of popularity that you can actually see by the thickness of the lines. So the more people that actually go through that route, the thicker the line becomes. It becomes sort of rich. That is that, that inherently human layer on that particular map, something that you don't really have in, in, you know, in other maps, such, such as Google Maps and so on. And GPS drawing is also one of my favorites. This is actually a really popular project with children. So the way that they do it is, is really trying to draw as you move within a physical space. So they usually take a class of kids, they go on an open space in a park, for example, and kids are told to draw the face of a cat or the face of an elephant. And they actually draw, as they move in a physical space, they have to draw that, that specific target, that specific subject. And then they go back to the studio, they isolate the map, they, 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 they remove the map, they isolate the lines, and then you have, you know, again, the face of a cat or the face of an elephant as kids move within a physical environment. And on that topic, you, we go to the third one, which is biomapping sketch, a, less, a little bit more technical uh, project, but it uses uh, a skin galvanic response system that basically tracks you know, your breathing, your heartbeat, and, and amongst other variables, and, and the GPS as well. So using those two devices, the authors are able to map, actually, almost like your emotional map of a city. As you actually turn every single curve, you have peaks of emotion as you navigate the city. So you have this emotional map of your neighborhood, this emotional map of a city, which again, could be really, really striking and very personal at the same time. And then moving on, I mean, there's a lot of different trends. Uh, you know, literature, there's a lot of people trying to understand, again, all the different connections within literature. I mean, Emma's note, the first one is, you know, just trying to map the, the, the fabulous engine of, you know, people who bought this also bought that in, within Amazon. But then you have much, you know, reach and complex initiatives. Uh, text Arc is one of them. Uh, it is actually trying to map the all interconnections within the, the, the Alice in Wonderland, the book itself, and all the different words that it's, it's being used in that, in that vast amount of text. And then you have Visualizing the Bible, which is the third one, that's trying to map all the different cross-references that every time a person is cross-references, create this arc. So you have like this, the, the, the key sort of figures that appear in the Bible, all cross-referenced from the very beginning to the, to the very end of the Bible. Delicious, I don't know if you guys use Delicious at all, uh, but the, I, use, I use a lot of Delicious. I use, probably use it more in the past. But Delicious is a social bookmarking system that allows, again, any, any of us to just quickly bookmark and access it from different you know, computers or, or devices uh, that you want. What's interesting about Delicious is that it makes it really, really easy for you to save, to bookmark a particular URL or a particular website that you really enjoyed. But when you actually need to retrieve that information at a given moment, it's really, really hard. I mean, at least for me, I'm, I'm very messy when it comes to my tags. Probably some of you are, can relate to that as well. So if you're probably, you know, if you're not like tightly organized with your tags, it's pretty complicated to actually retrieve that information when you need it the most. So a lot of visualization efforts when it comes to mapping delicious have been trying to, to really solve that issue. Uh, trying to, to minimize that effort uh, and trying to create visualization tool that allows you to be in a, in a more easy and straightforward manner to actually retrieve that information, the information that we need. But it's also tracking a lot of patterns of usage and, and bookmarking as well. 
Also, one of my favorite trends has been terrorism. And as many of you know, a lot of effort, money, and resources have been sort of put in, the, in trying to map many of terrorist networks and terrorist cells. And there's actually a really interesting book called The, the Starfish and the Spider. I don't know if you guys have read it. Uh, but it's really, inter really interesting that they, they, they create this analogy between, uh, again, the spider being uh, the hierarchical structure and the, the starfish being a non-hierarchical structure in the sense that if you cut the arm of the, the, of the starfish, it keeps on growing. Even if you cut the starfish in elf, it will keep on growing. It's a really good example of a non-hierarchical structure or organization. And, it's, and that is exactly the same challenge of most terrorist networks and terrorist cells, in the sense that there's no leader, right? It's, there's no centralized command. It is a highly non-hierarchical uh, structure. And that's one of the reasons that it has been so hard for us to track and understand uh, the structure, the organization behind a lot of these groups and communities, because they are non-hierarchical in nature. But you know, that doesn't really stop a lot, of, a lot of scientists to actually try to do that. So what you can actually see on number three, critical patching networks, is a map, yeah, the, 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 again, the resolution is pretty, the, the contrast is pretty uh, bad, but what you actually see, it's three layers that you can probably hardly see, but it's three layers of re relating to years, and this is actually a map of the, the terrorist network involved in the Madrid attacks a few years back. And what's interesting about this approach is that they divide that particular network in three different layers, three different years vertically. And then they actually map all the people that were present within those years. And then they create these blue lines that you can hardly see, connecting the people that were present year after year. So even if they don't, they're not able to actually track the leader, because there's no leader per se, but at least they track the people that have been constant in that network, the people that have been you know, always there from the beginning. So at least if you don't have the leader, you probably have people that are probably more influential or know a lot more about how the organization itself is structured. And then you have examples like Wikipedia, and that for me is you know, one of the most interesting efforts that we have done in the past years. I think Wikipedia is you know, one of the most complex rhizomatic structures we ever created, uh, and it's really interesting. And, and of course, that structure itself, it's so captivating to many people that it's not surprising that so many visualization and mapping efforts occur uh, and trying to really disentangle and really trying to understand this, this, this complex uh, environment. One of them, those two, the first two projects uh, have actually been mapped by Chris Harrison. And it's really interesting, Chris Harrison once, I read a quote from him saying, you know, why he was so fascinated with Wikipedia. And he said that it's just a remarkable source of knowledge. I mean, in six steps only, you go from subatomic particles to Snoop Dogg. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and he was like, that's really remarkable. So it was like, that was like the key motivation for me. Like, how can it, that even be possible, right? I mean, so he's trying to understand all the possible connections and interconnections between this vast rhizomatic structure. Pathway is actually a really interesting project. If you guys want to explore this, you know, this, this kind of like how to go to, again, um, subatomic particles to Snoop Dogg, this project, Pathway, actually tracks, it's very similar, it's like a browser similar to, to, to Firefox or Safari or others, but it actually creates this navigational layer on the top. So as you navigate different Wikipedia pages, it leaves the trail behind. So again, you can easily, so you can easily find your way back and find, you know, if you find, again, yourself in Snoop Dogg, you can find like all the different paths that you took to, to reach that, that, that goal. And then finally, the last trend is, is really the tree of life. I mean, as a huge, this is of course a very knowledgeable audience on this, in these matters. I'm not gonna bore you with that, but I'm a huge fan of Darwin myself. I, I read a lot about evolution and so on. And what's interesting is that Darwin, it was a, the only illustration on the origin of species was actually, the only one in the whole book was actually what he called the tree of life. And, uh, and of course, as you all know, a lot of effort has been going on in trying to come up, you know, different ways to map this, the, complex, the inherent complexities of, of our tree of life, mapping all the species in the planet. And these, of course, are some of them, many more, but this is a really ongoing trend in visual complexity as well. So what's also interesting about, again, when you map, when you track all this, this number of projects in, in, in visual complexity is that you end up having almost like the, the uh, different ways of looking at a lot of these patterns. My favorite way is actually looking at not only the subjects that are being mapped, but the methodology, the, the visual techniques that people are using. And this in many ways also relates to almost like a syntax, it's almost like a syntax of a new language. And you can see this new syntax, this new alphabet in many different ways. For me what's striking is that when you compare a lot of these projects side by side, 
And the very first one on the top left is actually a gene, a map, uh, a gene network. The second one is, is a map of IP addresses. And the third one is actually a map of, of Facebook friends. And for me, what's striking is that, again, you couldn't probably find more diverse and different data sets, but they're actually using all the same methods, the same methodology, the same alphabet, right? And what's really interesting, I've you know, been exploring a lot of these similarities across this vast number of projects, trying to build you know, this, this, this syntax of a new language, trying to build this new alphabet. So, and you know, we're even calling a lot of these names, so it's almost like a taxonomical effort in many ways as well. And these are actually all the, 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 the main 15 categories that I found as I gather a lot of these projects. So those 15 main ones are actually going to be uh, developed and exposed in, the, in my forthcoming book uh, to be launched in September. But a lot of these 15 are, in, a, in the book I actually expose you know, several pages uh, uh, exploring each of these techniques. But it's really almost like, it kind of is interesting in many ways that it's almost like a new alphabet of network visualization and a different methods and methodology that people are using across the board, across different, different areas. And then of course, you know, a little bit about principles of network visualization. We have seen that you know, this is remarkable, a lot of this effort, you know, different subjects, different methodologies, different techniques, but you know, inherently we can you know, not forget that networks are extremely, extremely hard to visualize in a meaningful way. But again, I think the key message here is that we don't need to make them more complex in the process of trying. So I think I'm just gonna expose a few principles that I think are really key for us to minimize that, that the visual complexity layer in many ways. So the very first one is really start with a question. There is a famous Danish saying that says, EU is ashamed of asking, is afraid of learning. And I think, again, start with a question, you know, having that right question for your project is critical to how successful it actually might be. So you probably all have seen this, this beautiful painting, uh, which is kind of like impressive, you know, given the, the latest uh, tragedy in Japan. But what's interesting about this painting is that the subject, the main subject, and that's something that maybe some of you don't know, is that the main subject is actually not the, the tsunami or the wave or you know, the fisherman's struggle with the sea. It's actually Mount Fiji. That's the main subject of the painting. In fact, this painting is part of a larger collection of 36 views of Mount Fuji. It's you know, about seeing Mount Fuji from the sea, Mount Fuji, how is it seen from the mountains, from the land, etc., etc. So it's like 36 different views of the same exact subject. So if you take that analogy, you could say the same for any data source, any database, right? The same database you could probably visualize in many, many different ways. You could view it from many different angles and perspectives. So what makes the choosing of a particular visualization the most accurate? It's really tying back to the question. Because it's only from the question or problem domain that we can ascertain that a layout may be better suited and easier to understand than others. It is that key driving question that's going to access, you know, again, the the the... The, your, the, the, the success of your project in the end. The second, the second principle, and it's really tied with, with the first one, it's really looking for relevancy. And I think you know, we can never forget that we are relevance-oriented. That is, we pay attention to information that seems more relevant to us. And relevancy, when it, comes to, when it comes to network visualization, and visualization in large, comes primarily in two areas. So when we actually choose the data source, and when we actually choose the visualization method that we want to. When it, when it comes to choosing the right, the most relevant data source, you know, sometimes we don't actually look to, to, we don't need to look for the more obvious data source, right? So you've seen the tracing the visitor's eyes, right? How people are using Flickr images to actually influence a lot of the, the decision making that happens in urban planning in Barcelona. But there's many others. Just Landed In is a project that actually uses Twitter. Uh, and the author basically grab, uh, every time a, a user tweets just landed in a certain location, he grabs that location and he grabs the location on the, on the profile of that person and he creates this arc. So in many ways, this is a tweeter generated uh, map of, 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 um, of traveling in, across the globe. So again, the data source sometimes, if you, if you question, if you find a question, sometimes you don't have to go for the most obvious data source. You can actually find interesting data sources elsewhere that sometimes give the same relevant information and sometimes even more sort of different layers of, of richness. When it comes to choosing the right visualization method, uh, it's again, of, of course, you know, primarily based on the particular question. That's, that should be the driving force of how you actually perceive and then you choose the right visualization method for, to answer that particular question. But it's also about understanding the different contexts of use and the different user needs 
right? So who is using your tool, how it's being used, when it's being used, and where it's being used. I mean, a lot of the, the context, that huge, you know, that, that broad uh, um, idea of context is critical to actually choosing the right visualization method. Uh, the third one is really about enable multivariate analysis. And this is really critical for network visualization in the sense that we, we cannot think about network connections as, as purely binary switches, right? Uh, they have endless layers of richness. If you think about, let's imagine for, for a second that we are tracking this vast network of, of river streams connected by the different locations that they actually uh, pass through. So imagine the richness of each, of the in, each individual stream as an edge. Each different stream has you know, different, temp, uh, different temperature, the water changes all the time, different pollution levels, uh, different speed of the water. I mean, there's a huge number of variables that we can consider when tracking any type of network. And you can think about the same for social networks. You can imagine, the, again, the, the layers of richness that exist with every single social connection that you have with your friends, family, and, and, and coworkers. And this is, of course, because we are, in the end, multivariate beings involved in the multivariate actions inhabiting in a multivariate world. And this is actually a quote from, a really remarkable quote from, from Tufti, saying that nearly all the interesting worlds, physical, biological, imaginary, human, we seek to understand are inevitably multivariate in nature. So that is really the power of, of, of multivariate analysis in, in network visualization. The, the, the fourth one is really one of the hardest to tackle, but it is something that we all need to be aware of. It's really the need to embrace time in network visualization. And this is critically important because, again, networks are evolving systems. They are constantly changing and mutating over time. Uh, you might even think about you know, the social network that exists within this room. Probably going to change us. You know, many of our, of our connections change on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. You have a fight with someone, you know someone else, new that just was brought into your life. So all those connections keep on evolving. A social network is a whole like evolving system, constantly changing. So there's a few approaches to mapping time. There's not actually that many, because it's just such a hard problem to solve in network visualization. But I'm just going to show you some of my favorites. Uh, this one is actually mapping the, the map, the, the underground map of, of London. What's interesting is that you see how the map morphs and it's constantly changing. So basically, if you click any station on, on, the, on the London underground map, it actually, that station becomes now the center point of your analysis, and the map morphs based on time. So you have these concentric circles based on, on five minute periods that you can actually see departing from the very location that you click. So it becomes a center. And everything else, the old map adapts based on all time, the time that it takes from that particular station you clicked on to any other on the map. But then one of my, also my favorites, it's you know, aesthetically not the most beautiful, but I think conceptually is one of the strongest that I've seen mapping time. Uh, and anyone that teaches or is a student in the audience will relate to, to the importance of, of, of this project. So this is actually mapping the, the different interactions between a student and, uh, between a teacher and the students in a classroom over, over the given classroom, over a period of time. So what's interesting is that you know, there's all so many answers that could, be, that could be explained just by exploring this visualization. So is a, a given student interacting with the teacher way too much? Is it interacting way too little? So there's a lot of like social dynamics that could be explored just by the fact that we are actually embracing time and mapping time and including time in this mapping of a, of a given social network. The fifth principle is, is really the need for us to enrich our vocabulary. It's to consider full spectrum of visual properties and interactive methods. So sometimes, you know, we look at a lot of these network visualizations, and you know, some of them actually have these outstanding aesthetic qualities. And if you look at the recipe of any network visualization, it's pretty drastically simple, right? There's a node and an edge, that's it, right? I mean, the elements itself are so, so simple. And then we actually don't, but we stay in that simplicity layer. We don't actually enrich those, those key ingredients in much, much more relevant ways. So what, what, I, what do I mean by that? I'm just going to show you some examples. The one, and this is actually just touching on the need for, for richer nodes in visualization. So the example on the left side is remarkable. I mean, this is actually an interactive project, but immediately you can see the richness of those nodes. They are so expressive in nature, right? You can see the inherent quality of each single node. If it's a video piece, if it's a news article, if it's a blog post, if it's a, a tweet, if is it a person, is it a Wikipedia article, is it an image? I mean, immediately you have a sense of what's going on within that network just by exploring the graphical qualities of those given nodes. 
And then if you explore interactivity, that you know, makes it even more easier. So this project, you can actually see all the different connections between countries in, across the world. But then as I click on the node, the node itself expands, and I have like all this information relating to that individual entity, to that individual node. So again, grabbing the, the power of interactivity to make nodes much, much, much more richer and interesting. And of course, when it comes to, to edges, it's the same thing. We need to make, we, ne we have to make edges so much more expressive, and they can be so much more expressive. They can carry a lot of weight, a lot of density. They can you know, communicate the intensity of a given relationship all the time, as you can see here, by changing the thickness of, of the lines. There's all these layers that edges can really communicate in a much mean, more meaningful way, meaningful ways. And of course, there's you know, the use of color in, in many of our projects to differentiate between categories or different groups. Or even to actually tell stories. It's actually hard for you guys to see, but this is actually one of my favorite projects. It, it, was, it was a social network of a given wedding. And, uh, and it was a, a fairly small wedding, so it was you know, fairly easy to map. But what's interesting about this map is that the edges between the nodes, between those circles that represent people, are actually telling a, a key story. So I can just read one of them. Uh, so, nearly died of sunburn after skin dipping in the Elk River with Chrissy. Uh, and then Aaron went to the same elementary school as Katie. So every people in that network is actually tied not just by an edge, but by a story, right? Again, it's a power of storytelling adapt, you know, put into a network uh, visualization itself, which is extremely powerful, you know, person and personal. So this, the, the sixth key principle is really about expose grouping. We actually need to be a lot more concerned about exposing grouping, about reinforcing relationships, reducing complexity, and improving cognition. So I think one of the key sort of learnings for us, and probably many of you are familiar with this, it's the three main guest out laws of grouping. And those are pretty, pretty interesting to actually try to map uh, relationships, uh, commonalities, and differences. So the first one is the law of similarity, which is all about graphical treatment. Basically, this law says that uh, elements that are graphically uh, similar apparent, appear to be more related than others that are not. And then you have law of proximity, which is you know, all about spatial arrangement in the sense that elements that are closer together appear to be more related than elements that are not. And then even moving to the law of common fate, which is re extremely useful for a lot of the motion and interaction pieces, which says that elements that are moving in a similar directions appear to be more related than others that are not. So a lot of the gestalt body of knowledge could be immensely useful for us to track and, and map commonalities across networks. The seventh one is really about understanding the value of three key visualization views within any network visualization. So these three views for me are, are really critical in the, in the understanding and mapping of, of these really complex systems. The first one, the first very key view is, is the macro analysis. It's, it's the understanding of the pattern itself, again, finding key groups it's just in a glance, I have a sense of what's going on in that network. Then I probably need to zoom in and have a better understanding of the relationship analysis, the connectivity amongst the given elements. And then the third and final key view of, of any network visualization is the, really the microanalysis, the individual entities, the individual nodes, and have a really, really qualitative uh, level of information regarding those individual entities. And then the final principle is really almost explaining ways that we can navigate through those three key views of, of network visualization in a progressive way. So there's many others, there's many techniques uh, that you know, can really minimize that process and make that navigation really seamless between the macro and the mi macro analysis. But these are just three that I wanna share with you guys. I think adaptive zooming is a critical example of, of, of uh, minimize the complexity uh, on, on, on network visualization. You've seen this, you know, this technique in many different mapping efforts. So the first one you can actually see here, uh, you know, in navigating any map, you know, Bing, Bing Maps or Google Maps, you should start off with a, with a broad canvas. In this case, it's Europe, and you just see the country names and the main cities. As you zoom in, you progressively disclose more information, right? So you have, as you progressively zoom into London, you have names of other cities, main main arteries, main streets, and then as you zoom in again, you have primary roads, you have secondary roads, you have all these neighborhoods around London. So there's, it's really trying to disentangle the, the, the complexities of a network and not showing everything at the same time, but progressively disclosing it as you actually zoom in, as you actually explore the network itself. And then of course, overview plus detail is a very common interaction technique that basically gives this overview mode on the top left that you see here, 
and he's, he's just easily provides you with you know, constant element of, of, of context of where you are in the large network as you explore these different layers of zooming and, and navigation within the network itself. But this one is actually one of my favorites. It's, it's called, the, you know, it's one of the elements, it's one of the examples of a focus uh, and context uh, technique, very, you know, very common in, in interaction design. What's interesting about here is that, again, instead of just showing the entire, comp you know, the entire network at once, in the, all the complexities at once, it actually allows the user to, as he navigates, as he explores the network, the network comes to life. It comes together as the user actually interacts with the network. Again, it's just really tying back to the idea of progressive disclosure. As I roll up, as I navigate the network, the network comes alive and comes to me. And I'm not, I don't need necessarily to actually show the entire complexity at one given time. So my, my last section of, the, of this talk is really about, we have seen how, how networks are you know, inherently fascinating and, and it has really become like a scientific meme in many ways, right? It has been driving this scientific revolution uh, and is, is this ubiquitous and fascinating structure. But what's really interesting to me is that networks itself, they're almost becoming a cultural meme in its own ways. And as many of us designers, scientists and others, actually trying to track and map all these really complex structures. At the same time, we are almost contaminating many artists, many artists from very traditional fields. And it could even be the case of a new, of a new field, of a new uh, movement, artistic movement, which for now I'm just calling networkism. So, and this is just some examples of, of networkism, uh, in my view. So what, the example that you actually see on, on the left side is IP mapping. It's a computer-generated map of IP addresses. What you actually see on the, on the left side is transient structure and unstable networks by a beautiful painting by Sharon Malloy, all on, and, uh, all on campus. Then you have other projects. This one, Operation Smile, on your left side, it's again a computer-generated social network where you see all the different pro portraits and interconnections between those people. And what you see on the, on the right side is Field 4, a magnificent painting by Emma McNally. It's, it's graphite on paper. So you can see really the infatuation of a lot of these artists by a lot of the scientific efforts that we're trying to, to achieve. And it's, there's no better quote than this by Sharon Malloy, one of these artists in, immersed in networkism. And she says that, my quest is to reveal how everything is interconnected, from the atom to the cell, to the body and behind, into society and the cosmos. There are underlying processes, structures and rhythms that are mirrored all around and permeate reality. And this is again, an artist, a painter, talking about the fascination for, for, for networks itself. And this could probably easily be something that you could read in a, you know, a book by Laszlo Barabasi or any other scientist exploring the fascinating world of networks. So these are actually some of, of, of that, that artist's paintings. Again, transient structure and unstable networks. Beauty, beautiful, beautiful paintings. Uh, these ones are by Emma McNally, Graffiti on Paper. Uh, again, really addressing this, this fascination over the network structure. But then, of course, networkism in many ways is not just two-dimensional. It is really three-dimensional. This is, has to be my favorite project of all times, and the title says it all. It's, it's called Galaxies Forming Along Filaments, Like Droplets Along the Strands of a Spider's Web. And uh, this project is actually fills entire rooms made of webs, these really, really complex systems of, of network systems, of, of networks. And what's interesting is almost like, and, and I, I've actually never seen one live, I just read descriptions about it. And I think apparently this is made of elastic rubs. And as you actually walk across, you can actually walk across the network, and as you bounce the network, the whole network in the entire room is affected by that bouncing, right? So it's like there is that element of, of unsustainability of the network itself. It's not something that's stable, it's something that's always kind of changing and, and morphing in many ways. And then you have you know, another project, In Silence, by Shiaru Shiota. This is a, an amazing project. It really it goes really deep. I mean, she actually fills entire rooms with these really dense, convoluted layers of, of, of black wool and thread. And sometimes she fills in objects. Sometimes even people are actually part of those, those, those pieces. And it's just remarkable. Like entire rooms are just filled with that really, really dense layering of, of network structures. And then you have you know, something else, you know, network, uh, the, the piece is actually called Network by Dali Bornikolik, and he's just actually just using plastic pipes to create many of these really intricate structures. So again, I think it's really uh, you know, quite uh, an awareness piece for me to actually see how many of these artists are becoming just really, really so contaminated by, by networks. And in many ways, it is really becoming this, this, this cultural meme at the same time. 
So just to end, I always like to, to, to end up with a little bit of a teaser. Uh, is there such a thing as a universal structure? So the example that you actually see on the left side is a mouse's neuronal network, which is you know, everything similar to ours, at least at this scale. And then you have on the right side, you have the Millennium Simulation. It was the largest and most realistic simulation of the growth of cosmic structure and the formation of galaxies. It was able to recreate evolutionary histories of approximately 20 million galaxies in 25 terabytes of stored output. And then here you just have another image of, of a neural network of a mouse. And the right side, you have again the same Millennium Simulation just at a different scale. And again, coincidentally or not, I just find this comparison fascinating in so many layers. I mean, you have this infinitely small bit of knowledge for us humans, and it's the largest scale of knowledge. You know, you have the, the atomic element, the neural network, and, and, the, and the, the, the universe in itself. And finding this resemblance and how everything is really interrelated is, is purely fascinating. And finally, just a bit of self-promotion. So my book is actually going to be launched in, in August, September. It's going to be called Visual Complexity, uh, Mapping Patterns of Information. And it's going to be published by uh, Princeton Architecture Press. And it's going to be out, hopefully, by August, September. And it's going to include a lot of the slides that you actually saw, a lot of these projects, and a lot of these syntax of a new language as well. So thank you so much. <laughs>